Hey, David, uh, now is the 9 a.m. in U.S. East Coast. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's, let's start. Um, hello, uh, good morning, and good afternoon, and good evening, our callers, colleagues from all over the world. Uh, welcome you again to this new World River and Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. So today we invite Professor David Kemper from China University of Geoscience Wuhan uh, come here, give a talk, uh, talk about North America, the human impact on North America, the Eurodia and the sediment transport and storage. And before I introduce David, as always, I want to say in the last uh, four years, since the last uh, uh, August uh, to now, we have already successfully hosted 76 talks and all talks are already uh, very well archived on our YouTube channel. As you can see, the short link is tinyurl.com slash S2S talks. So all the talks is archived there. Please feel free to use for your research or teaching education and uh, is open to for public. And uh, so starting from uh, uh, today, this new talk series is uh, funded by National Science Fund, US National Science Foundation, and also co-sponsored and co-hosted by uh, North Carolina State University, Louisiana State University in North America, and also in Europe, uh, Utrecht University, and also in Asia, State Key Lab of Estuary and Coastal Research, East China Normal University. We, as a partner, working together to co sponsor and co host this talk series. If you yourself or your colleague, your student, or postdoc, you feel they also can contribute a talk to this talk series, please let us know we will try to arrange. If not in the fall semester, definitely we can do it in the spring semester. Okay. And at the same time, if you want to keep informed about our weekly talk series, you can follow us on Twitter. The Twitter is source to sync, as you can see, and we will post all the talk, all the notice, all the announcement. And so for, the future today, you know, is uh, August the 4th. Um, we have uh, Dave give a talk. And then ne next week, Rip Hale from Old Domina University will talk about Ganges Bomapocha. As you can see, we have already lined up pretty good talk on Wednesday. So do we have uh, talks on Friday? We don't know. Next week, I will let you know. Maybe we will also add some talks on Fridays. But I want to point out to you like some uh, top-notch uh, talks like John Anderson, Leview, Downright, you know, all the way already scheduled here. So please mark your calendar and we will use the same, exactly same Zoom ID and passcode. And so, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this, uh, this here. So Dave, as we mentioned, Dave currently is a professor at China University of Geoscience in Wuhan. And specifically, he's in a state key la laboratory of biogeology and environmental geology in the School of Earth Science. And he used to be a lecturer in the University of Aberdeen and also he got his PhD in Open University UK and also a junior research fellow in University of Cambridge. His research in interesting is sedimentology and the geochemical response to abrupt, uh, abrupt climate change in the geological record and constrain the risk and the duration of the paleo environmental change in deep time and quantitatively analysis sedimentary record and the numerical method of stratigraphic uh, analysis. So today, Dave will talk about uh, 
what happened in the past the recent history uh, over the North America, particularly the human impact, the European colonial impact on the sediment uh, erosion and the transport. So I think I will give the floor to Dave. Dave, please go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Paul. Cheers. Um, yeah, thanks very much um, for inviting me, obviously, um, for this talk series. And I'm glad that, that you got some, some funding for this. It's a, it's a great idea. Um, yeah, as, as Paul says, today I'll talk a little bit about the human impact on, on North American landscape change. And largely, this is, um, this is a presentation based on a paper that myself and my colleagues had um, at the back end of, of last year that was published in, in Nature Communications. And the co-authors on that were, were Peter Sadler from California, Riverside, and Ville Van Acker from, from Louvain in, in Belgium. Um, so getting straight into it then, I think it's, it's been agreed and, and known for, for a very long time now that humans are are geologic agents. We are you know, major drivers of landscape change on the Earth's surface, perhaps you know, the major driver of landscape change. Um, and we've been modifying the landscape for, for many, many uh, years now, um, basically moving vast quantities of sediment. And that's apparent, I think, to, to anybody looking at how humans have, have shaped the landscape around them. Um, some early work was done on this kind of topic by, by Hook um, about 20 years ago now, where he essentially quantified the, the kind of the amount of earth that humans have moved. And, and what he recognized was that humans have had an impact on the landscape, obviously, for many centuries. But it's really only in the last century or two that movement of earth in particular has really accelerated. And that largely has gone hand in hand with economic development and population growth as well. And it's one of the kind of defining features, if you like, of, of the Anthropocene. And then in terms of what we what we think about when we when we talk about landscape change, I mean, the obvious thing would be soil erosion. So it's an obvious manifestation of the human impact on the landscape, essentially the process of just moving the, the surficial sediment from the Earth's surface around. And that could be by water, wind or gravity. But essentially, humans are the agents that enable that sediment to move in the first place. And that's obvious when we look at uh, intensive farming practices and agriculture. So. In general, then, we can see that globally, global sediment fluxes into rivers and lakes have increased markedly, and this is especially true over the last century. So humans have moved a lot of soil, a lot of sediment, and it's ended up in rivers and lakes. And the major causes for that there are, as I say, things like agriculture. So deforestation and land cover changes are the major factor then in driving this change. But also there's other things related, and that's overgrazing, for example, where we're losing soil stabilizing plants, changes in agricultural practices, which has enabled more and more sediment to be moved, and the loss of nutrients, which again has a destabilizing effect, and also more, more direct uh, movement of, of earth where we, we actually have construction and we simply churn up ground and it increases runoff, and this sediment then ends up in, in rivers and lakes. So, that may be so, and, and then we can kind of visualize that. I think all of us can. You know, we, we know what the effects of things like deforestation are on the landscape. And this is just an example from my colleague, Ville. It's an aerial photo of, of southern Chile where a recently deforested area has then led to enhanced erosion and the clogging of these rivers with, with sediment. So sediment fluxes into rivers and lakes have increased, but interestingly, sediment reaching the sea uh, in general has decreased. And, and this famous paper by, by James Savitsky back in 2005 quantified this and showed that, you know, humans are moving vast amounts of sediment, but it wasn't reaching the sea. And that's, that's actually not, not quite true everywhere. Recent work has shown that, that sediment supply to the sea, to coastal areas, has increased in the USA. But the reason why globally and in general it's decreased is because as well as moving lots of sediment, humans are also very good at storing sediment. So essentially sediment is being retained in reservoirs so things like damming has really decreased in general the amount of sediment reaching coastal areas um, and there's a picture of a dam obviously and again it just helps to highlight how damming itself can have a huge impact not just on water systems in around the earth but also in the way that sediment is moved around the earth as well it's something you can maybe appreciate from this this image so humans are causing landscape change via changes in erosion, transport and storage of sediment. And in general, soil erosion is, is the thing that kind of concerns us a lot. 
because many areas of the world, perhaps most areas of the world, are sensitive to soil erosion at least, and many areas are experiencing soil erosion. And this matters. Well, why does it matter? It matters, you know, from, from our perspective, it matters from a point of food security. Um, but also, when we think longer term, um, we know that changes in land use and, and changes in the way that soil and sediment is being moved around the Earth's surface has an effect on the carbon cycle. And the effect is actually not, not overly clear. Um, but the changes that humans are making to the landscape could end up creating a carbon release or it could end up creating a carbon sink and, and more work is really needed to understand the true impacts in different places and what the global holistic impact is going to be. So soil erosion and landscape change in North America is, is really the topic that I wanted to talk about and it's an ideal location to see the impacts of humans on the landscape and it's ideal because it's an area of, of the earth where we've seen rapid population growth and accompanying rapid alterations to, to the landscape. So there's been major changes to the natural land cover by European colonization, essentially, and that's been accompanied by urbanization, industrialization. The other reason it's a good place to study is that it has lots and lots of data associated with it. So it's somewhere where we can really get at the, the kind of mechanisms that, that, that lie behind this, this landscape change. And one of the things that, that comes to mind maybe when we think about landscape change in North America is the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, where essentially quite large areas of the US southern and Midwest states experienced a huge soil loss. And it's not really the topic I wanted to talk about, but it, it kind of underlines how humans, you know, motivated by, by things that interest us, have a, have a negative impact on the landscape. Um, in this particular case, there were simply too many farmers motivated by high wheat prices that led to too much tillage of soil, the loss of, of, of um, uh, existing um, plants in, in that area and the change to, to, to crops. And that created nutrient poor soil, which was, was unstable. And it had a huge social and economic impact. So when we look at, at the, the changes that we see in the, in the USA then especially, we can see that largely the changes we see are driven by, by population change. So European colonization was, was something that happened back in the, kind of the 1600s really. And it was a, a couple of hundred years after that when population started to grow that we had intensive farming as well. And the, the area of agricultural land, if you can see my mouse pointer, really accelerated around the beginning of, of the 1800s, around 1820, about 200 years ago. And the peak uh, uh, area of agricultural land on the USA surface was, was really coincident with this Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Um, the other thing that, that accompanied this rapid agricultural expansion was the construction of, of dams, and in particular mill dams. So the nascent milling industries of, of North America really took hold um, during the 1800s, and peak mill dam construction began uh, around 200 years ago. Now, when we think of dams, we often think of very large dams like the, the Hoover Dam or something, which was built obviously in the, in the 30s. But mill dams are very small, but there were very, very many of them built uh, throughout the 1800s and, and the late 1700s. And although they were obviously small, there were so many of them that they actually had a huge impact on Americans' waterways and a corresponding impact, therefore, on the way that sediment was moved around the surface of North America. And this was not just in the USA, this was also in Canada as well, where large numbers of mill dams were built. So what did all this mean? Well, it means that it's a place in North America, I mean, is a place where we can really see the impact of these agricultural changes, these damming changes associated with population increase and European settlement. So the first thing that we really notice when we actually begin to investigate this issue then is that when Europeans arrived, we see large increases in soil erosion and we see increases in river and floodplain sediment. And we call this sediment legacy sediment. So this is a uh, post-settlement alluvium, if you like. It's sediment that has been deposited directly as a result of the human activities associated with European colonization. And it's often quite easy to recognize when we're actually in the field, because what we'll often see uh, when we go to a sediment uh, profile in a channel or, or, or a stream is that we can see an old pre-colonial soil surface, this quite organic matter rich layer here. 
and that's that's the surface that existed basically when the Europeans arrived and then with their agricultural practices being put into place we then see the deposition of this post-settlement alluvium on top of that which is relatively organic poor but it's easy to recognize because of the color change and because of the fact that it doesn't have the nutrients that the old pre-colonial soil surface had so to quantify then the landscape change this post-settlement alluvium is quite useful because we can actually look at the thickness of this post-settlement alluvium we can look at the rates at which it was deposited and we can learn something about the true impact then of humans on the american landscape so how do we do this well <clears throat> the easiest way is simply to measure the rate at which this alluvium was deposited and that's relatively easy to do <clears throat> for instance we can look at carbon 14 dating and we can take some dates from within our soil profile and we can date both the pre-settlement sediment and the post-settlement sediment and this has been done in this particular example from from lee in 2016 and we can see that in this particular example from tennessee that around 1870 when european colonization occurred in that area we see this acceleration in the sedimentation rate of alluvium so there's a, a kind of a, a key timeline then of, of when humans began to have a big impact on the local environment in that particular area so other work's been done to try and quantify the impact of humans using post-settlement alluvium over a wider area and this includes work that was done by wilkinson and McElroy back in 2007 they looked at post-settlement alluvium accumulation rates from 15 sites across the whole of north america and again they were able to quantify that rates of sediment deposition had increased relative to the pre-settlement period before Europeans arrived. But to really understand post-European landscape change in North America, there's a couple of things we need to do. We need to quantify increased erosion and accumulation rates across the whole continent. So the work by Wilkinson and McElroy was groundbreaking in the sense that the impact of, of the results were huge and that they saw this massive increase in, in um, alluvium sedimentation rates associated with European arrival but they only looked at 15 sites and to get a real holistic view of what's going on we need to look at rates of sediment change uh, sediment accumulation across the whole continent the other thing we need to do is we need to be able to accurately compare post-settlement rates of, of accumulation to pre-settlement rates now Two things that we can do that to address these, these kind of these key issues then is, is obviously look at not just a small area, but look at the whole continent when it comes to actually quantifying accumulation rates. But this second issue of comparing post-settlement rates to pre-settlement rates, it's not as straightforward as it might first appear. And mainly that's because very often when we look at rates, the time span at which we look at the rate is very important. And when we're looking at changes in sedimentation rates driven by humans, that implicitly means that we're looking at changes in rates over the last century or, or two centuries, maybe. But when we start talking about geologic rates or natural rates of climate, uh, landscape change or indeed climate change, then we're typically looking over much longer timescales. And comparing rates measured over different time scales is non-trivial. And that's something that I'll, I'll talk a bit more about later. But I'd say this first point of actually trying to gain a holistic understanding of, of landscape change over the whole continent that demands a lot of data so what we essentially did in, in our study was we built a database of alluvium accumulation rates both pre-settlement and post-settlement from the literature and I should say this is this is not necessarily work that, that I started this is work that was was started by Peter Sadler uh, back in the 80s and he he made a big effort to quantify sedimentation rates not just in in North America but but globally so the database we had was was largely from what what he had already and then we augmented it with with rates from the literature uh, over the, published over the last sort of few years what we essentially end up with is a is a database of over 4700 rates and that's from 400 separate locations and 183 publications and as I say, these are both pre-settlement and post-settlement rates, and they range in age from modern, essentially zero years old, to the late Pleistocene, so 40,000 years ago. The map shows essentially where these are distributed with uh, each study site shown as a circle, and the bigger the circle, the more rate data we have at that location. So how do we actually you know, take the data from, from the literature? Well, it's, it's very simple, as I've already mentioned, one way that we can measure rates uh, of sediment accumulation is, is carbon-14 dating. So we can look at a sediment profile, we can find carbon-14 dates and a depth or a height recorded where that date was taken, 
and we can work out sedimentation rates from that. And it's not just radiocarbon, it's also things like 137 cesium, luminescent states as well, all very useful to quantify rates of sediment accumulation. We can also directly measure rates. So channel surveys, for instance. So surveyors will go to a channel or, or a stream bed. They will look at the actual thickness of sediment or the depth of the sediment surface from the, from the stream and then return at a later date, perhaps days, maybe even years later, make the same measurement and therefore you're able to quantify the change in that stream profile over a fixed amount of time. Dendrochronology is also useful and the database is made up of, of quite a lot of dendrochronology dates where when a tree grows we expect its root system to be pretty much at the ground surface and if we return at a later date when the tree has grown up and see that actually the sediment is now around the trunk we know that there's been sediment accumulation and the thickness of that sediment and the age of the tree gives us then our rate of sediment deposition. And there's not many of, of these kind of dates in the, in the database, but archaeology is also potentially useful where we have clear archaeological markers. And also, as I showed on the photos um, earlier, where you, you can actually see post-settlement alluvium overlying the, the pre-colonial land surface, overlying that, that pre-colonial soil surface, then it's very easy to actually fix that as the point at which we see the beginning of sediment accumulation and historical records will tell us when Europeans arrived in that particular area. So results then, this is what we end up with essentially, condensing all the data down into a single plot. We can simply plot the rate of alluvium accumulation from each of these 4,754 data points against age. And note that this is a log plot, so we've got log scale age on the bottom and we've got a log scale rate on the on the y-axis and I guess there's a few things you can you can note from this but maybe two things are key the first is that rates are highly variable in the last hundred years but perhaps as well you can see that about 200 years ago there's a clear change in rates of alluvium accumulation so just to put this into the context of time then we've got the first humans arriving here back in 16,000 years ago the Mayflower arriving and then around 1820 about 200 years ago is close to where we see this this kind of change this abrupt increase in alluvium accumulation rates and before that going all the way back to 40,000 years rates were broadly speaking stable and after 1820 in the last 200 years rates have been highly variable but definitely higher so is this real? Well, that's the question we need to ask ourselves. What does this actually mean? But first thing, obviously, is, is it real? Is, is this a true signal in the data? And obviously, we're using many different methods to measure sedimentation rates. But we can see that regardless of the method used, we see this increase. So we see the increase using the carbon-14 rates. We see the increase using stratigraphic rates, archaeological rates, whatever. It's, it's there and it's, it's, it's real also largely insensitive to age areas, errors, because that's obviously a concern with, with many dating methods which are not particularly accurate. Um, so it's, it's real then we think. So what does it mean? Well, the obvious thing that it means is that this is simply the signal of the human impact on the North American landscape. Because around 1820, where we have this big jump in accumulation rates, we also have the beginning of the rise in intensive agriculture in the area. And it's also largely coincident with the peak of mill dam construction, certainly in the eastern Euro USA. So it's also coincident with, with population growth as well, obviously. So again, we need to think about really then whether these data are, are robust and whether they're actually giving us a true picture of what's happening across the whole continent. And one of the ways we can do that is to, rather than look at each individual data point in the whole database, we just take the median rate for each of the 400 study sites and see if that jump is still there and obviously see then if the jump is real and it's not dependent on any single site or study. And when we do that and we plot the median of each of these 400 study sites, we see that this, is, this jump is still there. We see it's still apparent in all the, all the, all the data. But this is where the, the nuance to this kind of issue of quantifying rates comes in. When we color code the data by the rate measurement time span, we actually see that rates are dependent on the time span of measurement. What does this mean? Well, it means that essentially when we measure a rate over a long time span, um, then we see that that rate will probably be lower than a rate that's been measured over a short time span. 
So when you look at a color code and you see a very clear pattern whereby the slowest rates in the database tend to be measured at the longest time spans and they also tend to be old, whereas the fastest rates tend to be measured at the shortest time spans and they're generally young. So I'm sure many of you already know what this means. It's, this is actually called the Sadler effect. It's named for my co-author, Peter Sadler. He recognized back in the 80s from his compilation of, of sedimentation rates across not just alluvial systems, but all sedimentary systems, that rates measured over long time spans will typically be slower than those measured over short time spans. So we can visualize this very, very easily by plotting time span against rate. And when we do that, we get this very nice a straight line on a log-log plot, so essentially a, a power law, if you like. So why does it arise? Why do we see this? What does it mean? Well, the effect arises, the Sadler effect arises, because sedimentary sessions are, are incomplete, essentially. They contain hiatuses. And when we measure rates over longer and longer time spans, we encompass more and more of those hiatuses. And not just more hiatuses, but typically longer hiatuses too. And as a consequence of that, our measured rates of accumulation will fall. So this is a way of, of perhaps um, visualizing it for, for yourselves. If we imagine that we have a sediment pile, which contains hiatuses as indeed all sediment piles do, if we took a tiny portion of the sediment pile, i.e. a short time span, and we measure a rate, we might obtain a rate which is reasonably fast. If we then decide to measure a thicker interval, which encompasses a longer time span, then we begin to encompass some hiatuses. And because we've got these gaps, in this case, a 70 year gap and a 500 year gap, it means that our measured rate of accumulation will be lower than what we measured over the much shorter interval. And again, an even longer interval, this time we're encompassing a, a very long hiatus of 30,000 years, our measured rate of accumulation falls again. So this is why the effect arises. So ultimately then, the plot that we have of alluvium accumulation versus age is biased. It's biased by this Sadler effect. Post-settlement rates are fast because they're measured over short time spans. So how can we trust this jump then in the data? Is the jump still real? And how do we deal with the Sadler effect, this bias? Well, the simplest way to deal with it is to only compare pre- and post-settlement rates measured at comparable time spans. So in this case, if we assume that this jump occurs at 200 years old, about 1820, we can divide our data into pre-settlement data, pre-settlement rates which are all older than 1820, and post-settlement rates that are all younger than 1820. And when we color code the data in this way and, and replot our accumulation rate versus time span graph, we can see that there is this interval at time spans around 100 years where we've got comparable data. We've got data that's pre-settlement and data that's post-settlement, and those data are measured at the same time spans. And at those time spans then, we can compare things. And those time spans are about 40 to 400 years. And when we do that, I'm sure you can all see from, from the plot, from the color coding, the post-settlement rates are indeed still higher than pre-settlement rates when compared at the same time spans. In this particular case, disregarding for a moment the, the actual scaling in the, in the data, we said that in general, at time spans between 40 and 400 years, pre-settlement rates of alluvium accumulation are about one millimeter per year, and post-settlement rates are about 10 millimeters per year, so about 10 times higher, essentially. So is this real? Is this robust? Well, because we have enough data to actually make a statistical comparison, we can run uh, rank sum tests or, or Mann-Whitney tests man with the U test, same thing. And we can actually then derive a p-value on the significance of this difference. So we can actually see that yes, post-settlement rates are significantly higher than pre-settlement rates. And we could do Monte Carlo modeling as well that takes into account age errors, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, all these rate data contain potential errors in, in ages and therefore rates. And we can see that the, the result is still robust. And as I say, the mean difference then is around about 10 times. So we've got rid essentially of, of, the, of the Sadler effect bias by doing this, but could there be any other bias in the data set? One potential source of bias is this old wood problem that, that many of you may be familiar with, where if we're measuring radiocarbon um, dates in, in, our, in our alluvium sediment, as indeed we do for, for quite a lot of the, of the data in the database, 
we have to remember that the date that we get from the bit of woody material that we've measured is the date basically when the tree died and the date of deposition may come much later. So this actually could cause an overestimation of age and hence potentially an underestimation of accumulation rate. And because most of these uh, carbon-14 dates are pre-settlement, this could exacerbate the difference. It could amplify the difference between pre-settlement and post-settlement rates. But we can account for this by removing from the database any rates that are potentially affected by the Oldwood problem. And when we do this, we see that actually the results are not affected. So the Oldwood bias doesn't have an effect on our data, and we can account for it anyway. And I should just say as well that in terms of the carbon-14 dating, the database is full of carbon-14 dates, that some of which are, are, are sort of 70 years old now, uh, 60 years old, all the way through to the present day. Huge changes in the technique, huge changes in the technology involved in taking radiocarbon dates, uh, but all the dates have been calibrated to the latest, or it was the latest, uh, INTCAL 13 calibration curve. Any other biases? Well, we have to remember that the climate of North America is, is, is highly variable, but because we got quite a good spread of data, and especially a good spread of both pre-settlement and post-settlement data, we can confirm that there's no bias related to elevation, temperature, or precipitation differences between the data sets, between the pre- and the post-settlement data sets. So this is great because obviously we've been able to quantify a change in, in alluvium sedimentation rate associated with European colonization between pre and post settlement. But we had this you know, wonderful database of 4,700 rates and, and now we're only looking over this narrow time span window. So can we actually predict pre settlement rates on timescales shorter than 40 years? You see that 40 years is, is the minimum time span that we have for the pre-settlement rate data? Well, I think we can because, as I mentioned earlier, we have this scaling of post-settlement data that scales all the way back from, from centennial time spans back to essentially annual time, scan, uh, time spans. And that scaling is very, very obvious, it's very clear, and there's no reason to suspect that the scaling of pre-settlement rates, had we had them, wouldn't be any different. It's a reasonable assumption. And you can tell, I think, that, that around 100 years, the, the rate data from the pre-settlement uh, database does begin to show that, that kind of scaling. So we can quantify the magnitude of individual post-settlement rates relative to the expected natural pre-settlement rate at time spells between one and 400 years by taking advantage of this predicted scaling. And that then increases the size of the database that we have. And what do I mean by quantify the magnitude? Well, here's an example. We could take any individual uh, post-settlement data point, such as this one uh, up here, at a time, scale of a time span of about one year, and we can see that that data point, that individual data point, is about 156 times faster than we would expect in, in the pre-settlement data. And for balance, we can also see down here at a time scale close to a century, we have a data point of post-settlement alluvium accumulation, which is about 20 times slower than we might expect for the pre-settlement period. So using those data then, we can map the post-settlement rate magnitudes. We can essentially take the location of all the post-settlement rates that have been measured at time spans between one and 400 years, and we can put them on the map, put them on this map of North America, and color code them to show how much faster or slower they are compared to the expected natural geologic rate measured at the same time span. And what we can see from this map then is that we have a lot of red, and red means that these sites where we can see post-settlement alluvium accumulation, we can see that the rates at these sites are faster than we would expect of the natural geologic pre-settlement rate, and sometimes significantly so. In fact, when we crunch the numbers, we see that 94% of sites in North America have post-settlement accumulation rates that are faster than we would expect of the natural uh, pre-settlement rates. There's no clear geographic pattern or trend in these data, and that's interesting because, as I mentioned at the start, we had this major population growth that began in the east of, of North America, both USA and Canada, this was where a lot of the dams were built, for instance, but we don't see a clear signal of, of higher rates 
uh, in the east of, of the continent. So it suggests then that the high rates of alluvium accumulation that this plot is, is, is showing us is something that was universal across the whole continent. So what does all this mean then in terms of actual erosion and sediment movement? Well, really we need to try and quantify things to make it, you know, to put it into a context that we can understand, to put it into a context that's relevant to, to our concerns at the present day about soil erosion. So modern soil losses in the US equate to about 6,000 to, to 9,000 kilograms per hectare per year. And the area of agricultural land at the present day is about 4.7 times 10 to the 12 meters squared. So this equates to an anthropogenic, a, you know, a human-induced mass transfer of 2.8 to 4.2 uh, 10 to the 12 kilograms per year. And if we assume a sediment density of about 1,250 kilograms per meter cube, then that's a surficial loss of, of about half a millimeter. So in other words, every year, half a millimeter of the North American continent surface, at least in the agricultural areas, is, is being lost. We're, we're denuding the landscape by that much every year. So the average post-settlement sedimentation rate from our database, from our, from our data, I think you remember it was 10 millimeters per year. And that's measured on a centennial timescale. So we've got the loss of about half a millimeter from the agricultural landscape, and we're piling up that sediment that's been lost into alluvium stores at a rate of 10 millimeters per year. The difference there, the loss of 0.5 millimeter and the piling up of 10 millimeter highlights how the area where sediment is being stored, the area of alluvium deposition, is a fraction of the land area that's being eroded, in this case about 5 to 7 percent, and this fits with what we know about where alluvium is deposited, certainly at the present day. Now, you may remember as well that the average pre-settlement alluvium sedimentation rate from our database was around 1 millimetre per year, or 0.5 to 1 millimetre per year. So if we work back then, we can actually derive a rate of denudation from the landscape using that number. So assuming that the aerial extent of alluvium deposition has been broadly constant, it implies a natural erosion rate, certainly in the coterminous USA, where we have the quantifiable data, of about 0.01 to 0.04 millimeters per year on centennial timescales. Now, this kind of, this kind of uh, estimate obviously has a lot of assumptions associated with it, a lot of um, a lot of assumptions. In particular, we assume that all the sediment that's being eroded is being piled up in alluvium stores. And of course, some of that sediment makes it to the sea, after all. Uh, it also makes some assumptions about the aerial extent of both erosion and alluvium deposition. But what's pleasing about the numbers we get when we, when we crunch these data is that the estimates of 0.01 to 0.04 millimeters per year as a kind of a natural erosion rate for the USA is actually very similar to what's been quantified for smaller areas, smaller parts of the continent. And that includes estimates made using things like beryllium, where you can derive quite accurate rates of erosion. It's also these numbers, 0.01 to 0.04 millimetres per year, it brackets the estimate made by Wilkinson and McElroy in 2007 in their seminal work, where they were able to show that their denudation rate was something around 0.02, 0.03. So we get values that are very similar to that. But of course, our value is a value which we think broadly applies to the entire continent. And again, when we make some assumptions about the density of, of the sediment that's being moved, we can say that that natural mass transfer is something of the order of 0.14 to 0.42 times 10 to the 12 kilograms per year. So obviously those numbers are not necessarily easily comparable. But if we compare that, that natural mass transfer to the anthropogenic mass transfer, then we can see that in the last century, on that centennial timescale, we've moved as much sediment as natural process would typically move in a much longer period of time, something like 700 to 3,000 years. So bringing things to a close then, humans have had and continue to have, very obviously, a significant impact on the natural landscape. And we can see that in general, in a holistic sense across the entire North American continent, there's been a tenfold increase of alluvium accumulation soon after uh, Europeans arrived and colonized the, the area. And that increased alluvium, alluvium accumulation is something we can directly relate to increased soil erosion, something we can also directly relate to in, in intensive agricultural, industrialization, and population growth.
And again, just to reiterate that, that last conclusion then, in the last century, humans have probably moved as much sediment in North America as we'd expect natural processes to move in, in at least 700 years, perhaps as much as 3,000 years. Okay, thank you. Oh, David, uh, thank you so much for this fantastic talk. So I think now let me, okay, now our audience, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and mute yourself and, you know, ask David directly. So David, I have a question, um, quick question. Um, you show a beautifully around, you know, 200 years ago after the post of the settlement, the increase the reach. Are you able to see the pattern? Because earlier settlement, mainly the Easter coast, you know, tobacco, they, you know, knock down the trees, deforestation. Mm -hmm. Then gradually they shifted to the middle, to the California, the, to the good mining, you know. Did you, are you able to see the time difference, the progressing change from east to western coast? Uh, no, un unfortunately not, we weren't. And that's that's largely a consequence of the fact that although we you know we start out with this this wonderful big database of nearly five thousand rates, we can only really make some accurate quantifications over you know using a, a subset of that, so uh -huh. using about five hundred rates, and that means that the resolution isn't quite there to actually discern a pattern that's that's sort of you know a geographic pattern. Yeah, but um, me. Sorry, at least in this data set. So it, what I what I should say is that if we drill down into the individual studies that have been used, then I suspect the pattern will be there. But it's not mm. something we can glean, you know, from the from the overall pattern that we see in the compilation. Maybe you can make a quick try. Let's you know just a part of two data set, east coast, west coast. See if any time slightly different. I, I, Even I, that I, slightly, yeah. that's still significant. I, I did, um, oh. but it wasn't significant. So oh. <laughs> it wasn't statistically significant. Okay, um, cool. No, but but we're not. You know that that plot that I show where we're trying to quantify kind of the the, the magnitude of the change that we see uh, relative, you know, in post settlement rates relative to pre settlement rates. You know, as I said, there's no there's no clear pattern. But you know, I think as well that that plot, although it's more data rich than what's been published before, it doesn't really have enough data for us to be, mm. be sure, um, and that's that's part of the problem. So, okay, yeah. cool. Okay, now uh, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, very good talk, David. Um, my question is, if I understand correctly, you, in terms of the remobilization of this, let's say predominantly from ag-based systems, as you start redirecting this material to dip, different depot centers where the alluvium is accumulating, you said that's it's only 5 to 7 percent of the total location, uh, relative area. It, it, so it's very well defined. What types of environments would this kind of material be, be going to? Are these in lakes or uh, fresh water wetlands or it's 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 everything i think the the yeah the key the key thing that that comes out of studying the the data set is the and, and something that's been sort of discussed before is that most of the sediment that gets eroded doesn't travel far so what we see is that if you have an area where erosion is taking place the sediment that's being eroded tends to then arrive you know at the bottom of a hill slope it's not moved very far and this actually is, is beneficial to us because it means that we, we're not seeing sediment, you know, a huge amount of sediment lost. I mentioned earlier that one of the assumptions is that we assume no sediment makes it to the sea. And of course, that's, that's wrong. But largely, by and large, the sediment that gets eroded doesn't move far and it accumulates close to where it was eroded. And as you say, yeah, that can be any kind of environment. The data set we have is largely floodplain. It's largely channel uh, surveys. Not, not really lakes, but there was a study very recently that, that looked at lakes, uh, which showed that there's been a, a, an enormous increase in lake deposition over the last last century or two. So, Okay. And, and just one last uh, question on that would be, um, is it mostly fine grain material? 
Yeah, we don't, we don't, quant- we didn't quantify the lithology. So that's another key assumption. That's where the, it gets a bit um, difficult to make accurate quantifications based on sediment density. It's everything. It's alluvium is very broadly defined, and it can be subdefined as well as, as I'm sure you know. And and we don't define the basis of lithology, but looking at the literature, looking at the database, it's largely fine grained. It's it's this essentially soil. So yeah, it's not. It's not gravels uh, by and large, and it's not conglomerates. Thanks very much, David. Could could you send me that paper on lakes, if you don't mind? Sure. Yeah, I will do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, David. Uh, I, I can send you the Tom's contact if you can. Uh, Tom Bianchi, a famous guy. Yeah, no, I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll do that. Okay. Uh, Teal, go ahead. Yeah, David, thank you so much for this really great presentation. I, I think it's it's amazing, you know, this progress to really scale up towards the whole continent. Um, I think I have a kind of follow-up question, um, you know, on Tom Tom's last. Um, so you played with two terms. One was sediment accumulation rates, and the other was sedimentation rates. Um, I'm, I'm a sediment geologist, and, and of course, there's distinct difference. Um, so if you want to talk about volumes and masses, of course, you know, you, you need to know which kind of sediment it was, but also how dense the sediment is. So um, as, as we know, the older sediment is, the, the higher the degree in, uh, of com- compaction is. Um, if the sedimentation rate was high and is young sediment, then compaction might be just half of it or something like that. Um, so could it be that um, to a certain degree, just the, the, the degree of compaction and the type of soil might somehow influence your data you show. Yeah, it's something we definitely considered and, and I apologies for not, not mentioning it in, in, in the talk. Um, one thing you can get from this plot of alluvium accumulation rate versus time span is that if, if you look at, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but the, the dashed gray lines running diagonally they're lines of constant sediment thickness Um, and you can see that the 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 data extend to a line of constant sediment thickness of under 100 meters so in other words sorry it's a very long-winded way of saying that none of the data that we have uh, were taken from sediment profiles that were thicker than 100 meters and indeed most of the sediment profiles were less than 10 meters so for that reason, we don't feel that compaction would have been something that necessarily affected our data. Um, I, I, may, I may be wrong because I'm, I'm trying to remember what we what we had in the paper now, but I think at that kind of sediment thickness, we might expect compaction of the typical alluvium lithology of about 3%. So playing with that, we're able to see that it wouldn't affect our, our data, our, our results. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you consider that. Um, but of course, it makes a big difference if you have sand or clay or a, a good mixture of different grain size fractions. Sure. Yeah. No. The um, I'm trying to think now what what paper we used. It was a we used a paper to to quantify that, and we were conservative in the sense that we assumed the the largest compaction factor for I think it might have even been a a peat rich sediment. I, I have I, I just I'm afraid I can't remember the the paper we took it from, but. For sure, we we were conservative in the sense that we used the biggest compaction factor we had, assumed all the data had that compaction factor, and then were able to see that it didn't statistically affect the results. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much. Thank you, Tio. Now, uh, David, uh, David Grumman. Yeah, hi. Um, I really enjoyed the, your talk. Um, I, I have a question about the some of the geographic trends, you said that, that we're not any in the rate change. I'm just wondering in this data set, if you have looked at uh, changes just in the absolute rate geographically that might relate to topography or relate to the substrate, you know, l- lust covered or uh, clay versus sandy, that sort of thing, as far as the local geology or substrate. Yeah, we, we wanted to do that, um, but so many of the rates that we we had were from quite old literature and as, as i said at the beginning largely it was it was peter sadler's database and we i augmented it with with rate data from the last kind of 20 years 
But in the, in the, in the bulk of the literature, we, we didn't have the information on lithology typically um, because often it was just simple reporting of radiocarbon dates and not much else, which is why we kind of lumped everything as alluvium, going back to the, to the earlier question. Um, and then we looked for um, detailed land cover and, 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 and geologic um, data that we could overlay onto the, onto the database we had overlay onto our maps. Uh, but, but ultimately, we didn't have the resolution needed to actually see those kind of nuances, see those differences. The only thing we could do was look at elevation um, and see that, you know, it, regardless, the elevation didn't seem to have any impact on, on rates of, of accumulation or anything like that. But what we wanted was, was hill slope. We wanted to know the, not just the elevation, but whether these things were, were on some kind of slope or at least very close to slopes. But again, we didn't have the resolution data to get that. It's something that I'd like to do, though. OK, thank you. Bruce. Yeah, David, great talk. Um, <clears throat> I, I, something that's, uh, I think, uh, very necessary to try to put this in context. I have one question about, um, it's related to Dave question about the geographic variation. Um, can you go to your slide where you show how you determine the natural rates? And then from that, you you do the accelerated versus... Do you, do you mean this this one? Uh, I think it's the one before that. Uh -huh. it, like... Yeah, they, there, yeah. right. So, so you're scaling absolute accumulation rate um, and then you're using that for for the the pre-settlement and then using that to determine how amplified it might be I guess my my comment there might be that wouldn't it be more meaningful in, in an absolute sense to compare that by site. In other words, what's the what's the actual pre-settlement rate at each site? And then what's the post-settlement rate at each site? Because if there is site-to-site -site variation for some reason related to topography or whatever, then that would be I think the more accurate way to assess the post settlement rate, because if there is geographic variation, that's not that's not really accounting for geographic variation that 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 scaling relation that you have on there. Sure, you're you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so when we when I first got hold of the, the database, that's exactly what I tried to do. I wanted to take locations where we had both pre-settlement rate data and post-settlement rate data and make that direct comparison. But what we found or what I found was that um, by and large, there are very few locations in the database where we're able to do that. And primarily it's because of the motivation behind the individual studies. You know, we, we studies that, that look at, you know, ancient radiocarbon dates and not also then looking at the post-settlement alluvium that sits maybe on top of the sediment they've studied and vice versa. And that's ultimately what motivated us to do this kind of study where we have to just bring all the data in a, in a kind of a large data way of doing things to make the comparison. Um, and the other problem we had is that very often when you have a, a pre-settlement um, rate, what we found was that the median point, you know, so to make a to get a rate, you need a, a sediment pile, and you have a date at the bottom of the pile and a date at the top. And very often, you know, the date at the top is in the post-settlement period, and the date at the bottom is in the pre-settlement period. And the midpoint of of the of the actual um, time span is our age. That's 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 the age we have, and we might call it post-settlement, we might call it pre-settlement, depending on where it sits. But actually, it's encompassing both the pre-settlement and the post-settlement period. And actually, it's, it's another bias I, I didn't have time to talk about, or, or maybe I did because I didn't talk that long. But, but, but we, we were able to really deal with that by stripping out all of those data where that happened. We end up with a much smaller data set, but we also end up with a robust result. 
Um, so, you know, long story short, we, we couldn't make the direct comparison, but we were careful to make sure that that, that we weren't biasing the data by by kind of looking at both, you know, both pro-settlement and pre-settlement at the same time. Right. Yeah, I think I think it's it's under doing this large study. I think it's a reasonable way to go. I guess I just wanted to say that you know the work that that Dave's done here. Um, we, we were comparing some of the uh, accumulation rates in glaciated environments in the Midwest to the driftless region, where of course we have tons of data for the driftless region on on uh, post-settlement uh, accumulation. And we're finding that the rates are actually the same, but the, abs the, the, the relative rates are the same if you mm -hmm. scale them, but the absolute rates are very different. So mm -hmm. you're getting, you're getting, you know, if you do it in millimeters per year, um, then they differ dramatically. But if you, but if you do them according to pre versus post, the, the increase is the magnitude of increase the the amount of times that it's mm -hmm. gone up is, is equivalent. So there might be a ten time there might be a ten times increase, but yeah, the absolute yeah. rates are are much different for the two areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. Yeah, yeah. That's so so anyhow, I guess you know that's because if you were to compare a point for East Central Illinois with the Driftless region on this kind of plot, you know you would get you would get some enormous increase um, that that wouldn't reflect the actual increase relative to the pre-settlement rate in yeah. in the flat landscape of, of East Central Illinois. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so anyhow, I just, I think topography, I guess my point is I think topography does matter. I think, uh, you know, slope is probably an important factor, but yeah. teasing it out is, is, is a tricky problem. Yeah. Well, yeah, and as I say, we we I wanted to look at the data and the you know the the, the slope data as well, and I I didn't have it. But it, do you know if there's a you know a fairly high resolution data set of slope for the for the continental US or, or whole of North America? I mean, I most areas have lidar now. I mean, um, you know, it's 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 amazing how much if you go to the 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 USGS national topographic database. I mean, mm. they, they, there is a lot of LIDAR data now mm. available for most areas uh, of the country. I think everywhere, yeah. but everywhere, but generally like Alaska, I don't think Alaska has any data, but, um, but most, most areas there, there is, I mean, you'd have to tease it out, but um, there might be another data set that's, that's been derived from DEMs or something. Yeah, I, mean, well, as I, said, I didn't didn't find it, but hey, I'd I'd like to do that, and I think yeah, your your point is entirely valid, and and, and that's something that, that that should be done. Yeah, but but any, I'm not I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just I, it's a great <laughs> study. You, you did a great it's great work, really great Thanks. work, and yeah. and I just think the next step might be to try to look at this geographic variability because I think it is I think it probably is there like like you're recognizing, but it's it's hard to tease out. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, any any other busting comments? Um, if not, uh, thank you, David, very much. Before we go, I want to two more things I want to sh share with you. And the paper, uh, the main paper David pr the present is published on Nature Communication last year. So you can refer this paper. And so uh, the other thing is um, about our coming coming talks. So as you can see, there's a whole bunch of good talk have already been lined up. And it, once again, uh, in the invitation, if you, yourself, your colleague, student, uh, you know, could also contribute a talk, please let us know and uh, we will try to arrange. And by seeing that, thank you very much, Dave and everybody, the participants.
and uh, I see you next week. So next week, uh, Rup here will talk about uh, the Ganges Bo Boma Pocha. Okay, uh, the Great River. Uh, then we can.